Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another session in our 2021 Climate Action Webinar Series. My name is Bill Burke, AIA, co-chair of the AIA California's Committee on the Environment Education Subcommittee, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. As you know, AIA California has developed an in-depth series focusing on understanding and implementing the AIA framework for design excellence. This series has offered 28 webinars so far this year. As always, all webinar content and additional resources will be available on the AIA website shortly after each session. Really, that means give us till Friday for this one. Uh, a few quick housekeeping reminders before we get started. Uh, you'll notice that you have a Q&A function and a chat window. We really would appreciate it if you would use the Q&A function to ask questions for today's presenter. Um, you can also like a question so that we know that more than one person um, has that question. Um, Dr. Graham will, will do her presentation and then we'll come to the questions after the end of the presentation. So uh, please enter them as we're going along. So now on to today's webinar. First, I uh, just want to let you know that it qualifies for 1.5 AIA HSW learning units for those watching live and AIA California staff will report these units for you. The session is also being recorded and will be posted on the AIA California website with additional resources and a PDF of the presentation again probably by Friday. Uh, so this program will examine successful post-occupancy evaluations, sometimes referred to as POE. Um, and I just want to point out to you before we get into a description of, of today's program and our presenter, that the AIA Strategic Council uh, recently called for a review of AIA contract documents to facilitate and actively promote the routine use of post-occupancy evaluations with open reporting of outcomes and sharing of standardized data. So in the, in the chat window, I will post a link to that document, but don't use the chat for questions, okay? All right, so um, today's, today's presentation, of tracking operational energy use via utility data and occupant surveys are invaluable ways to assess building performance and aspects of indoor environmental quality and occupant satisfaction. They also help to refine and improve building operations. The Center for the Built Environment, CBE, at the University of California, Berkeley, has developed a cost-effective web-based occupant survey that takes approximately 10 minutes to complete. The survey has been implemented in over 1,000 buildings around the world with responses from over 100,000 people. Originally developed as a research tool, the survey has become widely used to receive feedback from employees. CBE survey, survey results have demonstrated the value and importance of focusing on the human element of buildings and how occupant perception can affect energy consumption and general satisfaction with the space. So I would like to quickly introduce today's presenter and then we'll get started. So Dr. Lindsay T. Graham is a personality and social psychologist who specializes in the ways in which people craft, select and shape their daily physical and virtual spaces to best fit their lives. She is an expert in the measurement of people within virtual and physical spaces and post-occupancy evaluation methods. Through her research, she explores the person-environment relationship and how design can enhance the ways in which we do things such as complete our work, form social relationships, express our identities, and accomplish our daily activities and life goals. Dr. Graham is the founder and leader of the Psychology of Space Research Program at the Center for the Built Environment at the University of California, Berkeley. There she works with industry leaders and researchers around the world to measure and assess occupant behaviors and the effectiveness of spaces in supporting user needs. Dr. Graham received both her bachelor's and PhD in personality and social psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. She regularly consults with startups and established firms within the building and tech industries on how to conduct research and apply research findings and practice. In 2015, she was a research scientist at Cadre, HKS Incorporated's nonprofit research consor consortium, 
And in 2017, she was a research fellow at Perkins and Will's Human Experience Lab. She also has personal experience in transforming and bringing scientific findings into the marketplace and was, and was a recipient of the Department of Energy's Catalyst Business Innovation Grant in 2016. So obviously we've got a great person to talk to us about occupant experience and post-occupancy surveys. So with that, please take it away, Dr. Lindsey Graham. Great. Thank you so much, Bill, and thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to chat with you all today. And um, just to kind of get us started, um, I'll, I'll give you some background about myself and also about CBE, and then um, we'll focus in on post-occupancy evaluations. And um, I'll be talking with you a lot about the research behind these tools and what goes into it, how to find a good tool for your own project, um, as well as, you know, where we, as people who are interested in creating healthy, good spaces for people, um, should be pushing ourselves and others um, along with our projects as we move into the future. And then uh, also, you know, I'll open the floor, of course, for questions, and we can also have some more kind of discussion about how to more practically think about these concepts within your own projects and work. So as Bill mentioned, I'm part of the Center for the Built Environment at UC Berkeley. And what we are is a research industry consortium. Um, within UC Berkeley, we have roughly about 50 industry partners at the moment, and um, they range from building owners and those who are just understand the value of built space to uh, architecture, engineering, manufacturing, um, and other sorts of building stakeholders within the field. So it's a great group of people, and it's a an excellent uh, opportunity for uh, us to share ideas. And then the goal of our work is always to be responsive to industry need and what's really going on um, within the field, not just within academia. And so just to give you a high level sort of overview of some of the broad areas of work that we exist within, um, we look at indoor environmental quality, we have a large focus too on energy efficiency um, and low energy envelope systems, controls and human interactions, and um, tools and adv advocacy within built space. So our work sort of spans these broad fields and overlaps one another. Um, and like I mentioned, we do a lot of work with industry leaders, both within our partner consortium and outside. And um, our aim is always to be creating responsive research to what's going on um, and trying to meet the needs of the field. Um, Bill, you have a great background for me, but just to kind of give you some highlights too in context of where I'm coming from, as he mentioned, I'm a personality and social psychologist. So basically all that means is, is that I, I look at sort of like the average person um, and specifically, I look at that within the context of our environments. Um, I've done work both in virtual and physical spaces and kind of that overlapping intersection too um, in the past. And of course, now as we're all in this new world, I am interested in keep continuing to explore that. Um, I lead our group's uh, psychology of space program of work, which really focuses on this person place interaction. So how do we impact the environment and how does the environment impact us? Um, and I also have specialty in psychometrics, which is basically the study of how do we translate and generate measurements of human behavior and thoughts and attitudes into something that we can quantify. And um, I also have done a lot of work within the realm of indoor air quality too. So <laughs> to get us going, um, I'm sure this comes as no surprise or novel sort of concept to anyone in this room, but um, 
as we all know, spaces have the potential to influence how we think, feel, behave, even interact with one another, but one space doesn't fit all. And so with that, it's really important for us to try to understand those differences, both in the environments as well as in the ways that people are perceiving and engaging with those spaces. And so why we're all here today too is thinking about sort of historically as we've looked at this within the field, we've really had a focus on building performance and um, what sorts of materials and things are going into this space. And so what I mean by building performance when I say it this way is I'm talking about, you know, the more sort of technical pieces of it, like um, What's our energy efficiency? How are we, how are our systems operating? How are people responding to those, et cetera? And even looking at, you know, design functionality and whatnot. But what um, sometimes and often gets neglected is that occupant piece, um, the purpose behind why we even have buildings. And when we do happen to look at that occupant piece, what, um, POEs have primarily focused on through the years is this idea of comfort and environmental satisfaction. So what's sort of like the baseline of how we're existing? We even see this in some of our standards. Um, for instance, in uh, our ASHRAE standard looking at thermal comfort, we even say that something that's like slightly okay is what we're aiming for and is satisfactory. Um, but of course, our person place relationship is much more complicated than just looking at satisfaction. And I'm sure this is um, something that everyone here has probably noticed. We also have seen this sort of shift through time of what uh, the field is really focusing on and what we're seeing we value within our spaces and for occupants. And so there's been uh, sort of this evolution around looking at productivity, but then also now health and well-being. And I just sort of want to pose the, the idea and the thought of if we're shifting our attention around, um, we should also be shifting beyond just looking at this baseline of having just satisfactory environments and really look at how can we make ourselves spaces in which we can thrive within them. So where do we start? and even trying to make this shift. We've seen lots of conversations emerging and people trying to pinpoint um, and make these sort of big claims on how environments support us. And we know that there's validity and truth to that, but one really important place to start is to really look at how we're measuring and what we're really determining is actual success within these environments. So some of you may have seen reports like this that are talking about, you know, how office spaces or how buildings are performing and how they're supporting people specifically in the context of say, productivity or well-being. As I said, these sort of buzzwords that have emerged. And you've all probably seen some sort of infographic like this before too, where we're talking about how these spaces that we've built have this capacity to just increase productivity or really enhance it in some sort of way and um, really support people. And, you know, we even see research studies that have come out um, from academia and other sources that are showing, you know, we've got these huge increases in how we can bolster occupants within space. And so, all of these are great aspirations and helpful metrics to start thinking about. Um, but they sort of fall short in some ways because we don't see a lot of cohesion. We don't see a lot of cohesion in how productivity is assessed. We don't see a lot of cohesion in what those metrics um, amount to, what the outcomes tend to be. And even in how we're tying these specific environmental features with these more sort of abstract psychological metrics like productivity. So in thinking about that, I just want to raise this concept that we can't really measure productivity for any variable for that matter until we define it. 
And we can't really define it until we know the nature of the work for each and every building and each occupant within that space. And of course, in saying that, that may have even triggered you to think, well, that sounds impossible. And in some ways, it is. That's hard because work really varies from person to person. Um, and even like if you think of your own productivity over a day, what you were doing this morning or early this morning is probably very different from what you're doing right now, which will be very different from what you're doing in the afternoon. Yet all of those have some sort of validity around your productivity. So the central point around this though is, is that if we don't have standard methods um, and measures to look at these sorts of constructs, then it makes it really hard to start comparing and generalizing and making these claims and progress towards spaces that really support these things. So as I was pointing out, like think about your own kind of productivity throughout the day or that of your coworkers or family and friends, and it shifts. And so here are some of the ways that others have started to define productivity and that research has looked at how we can begin to quantify that. And as you're looking at this, like, you know, we've got things ranging from self perceptions of performance. So like how well, how productive do you feel you are today um, to things that are more sort of concrete or cognitive tasks. So this is looking at things like our memory functionality, how quickly we can perform different sorts of things. Um, even our comprehension. Uh, and then of course, we've got other sorts of things like clerical work. And those tend to be, depending on the population that a researcher is studying, um, things like clerical work has been sort of the default for a long time. Um, and we've pushed into these other concepts that capture more sort of knowledge worker um, constructs of productivity. And then of course, you've got these other components that deal more with a person's behavior, like their absenteeism or how um, frequently they show up to work, as well as health metrics and looking at health as a proxy for how well somebody might be doing um, in their in their job. And then of course, things like job satisfaction and then organizational components. Um, but the point being is that there's lots of ways that we could define this. And, um, you know, it's likely the environment is important to many, if not all of these things. But with this sort of lack of cohesion, it can be really hard to start to draw those sort of connections and really know how to design a space to promote this broader concept of productivity. So let's just take another concept um, like worker well being. And again, these same sorts of infographics exist on how, how well being supports people and, or how the environment supports well being to support occupants. Um, but really thinking about what well being means, if we know that productivity, um, can be defined so many ways. We also have to ask that same question for well being. And with that, it really depends on who you ask and who, which field you ask more specifically. So, just even within psychology, a field of study that has spent a lot of time focusing on this concept of well being um, through the you know, last hundred years or so. We all have, uh, or there's all sorts of different kinds of theories and concepts that have come up within that too. Um, this is just a little snapshot of some of the folks who have worked around those ideas and their kind of primary theory around it. But what it really amounts to is that they all kind of focus on this idea that the individual is achieving some sort of autonomy over um, overcoming challenges as well as mastering their life in some specific way. And even within that, um, it really sort of boils down to this idea of like life satisfaction and satisfaction in other domains of our life, like our work life, our relationship life, our family life, our health life, um, and then our emotions and how those fluctuate and change per day. So 
that's just how psychologists are thinking of well-being. And um, that tends to be sort of the flavor that our field is starting to think about it. But there's other ways, of course, to measure well-being too. Um, so if we were looking at it from sort of an economic standpoint, um, they well, or an economist might measure well-being as having more resources. So the idea being that the more resource you have, the more you can actually um, support your life and have access to the things that you need, which in turn makes you feel happy or satiated. Um, and then, you know, as I said, we've sort of come towards this idea of psychological well-being within the field of building science, but we've also been incorporating this other concept too of that it's really about our physical and mental coming together. And um, those two things working in tandem with one another to create true well being, and thus the environment supporting that. So you might be asking, well, what is it then? So it's a combination of all of this. It's, it's trying to think through how do each of these pieces work with one another and add to one another um, to support that sort of overall well-being. So you might be thinking, okay, what's the what's the point? Like, why are we going through all of this? We're here to talk about post-occupancy evaluations. And what I am hopefully trying to illustrate is, is that um, any variable or any thing that we're trying to quantify is really complex. And especially when we're trying to look at people behaviors and the ways that individuals think or feel and how they even perceive the environment. And especially when we start to incorporate these other sorts of concepts that are really important to our project supporting, um, it gets complicated. And so what is helpful as like a starting place is to think about well, what really is the goal of my particular project? What is it that we're needing this space to do? What needs to be supported here? And in identifying that, um, that helps us identify what is it that we need to know from those occupants to really measure um, and assess how successful our space is, so how well it's meeting those goals that we've set for this project. And with that, sort of the next step is thinking about the, metho the methodology that you're going to use to actually assess those people in that space. And, you know, there's a number of things to consider there, but I've just kind of tried to call out the big things being time, both yours, your clients, as well as the occupants who you're going to be asking these questions of, um, the resources to actually invest in the measurement and in this effort to try to assess your space, and then what methods actually fit those variables that you're trying to assess too, because that can shift over time. And from there, trying to find the right method that really accomplishes these goals. So there's all sorts of things that uh, are ways that we could do a post-occupancy evaluation, ranging from more kind of in-depth conversations like interviews or focus groups. So having a handful of folks talk about the space with you in depth and their experiences with those environments. Of course, there's an observational option where we can go in and either naturalistically observe, so not having any sort of interference with the occupants themselves, or um, more specifically in, in targeted ways, try to complete observations, like either during specific tasks or with with uh, engagement with the, the occupants themselves. And then, of course, there's surveying. And, um, you know, we can do this in a number of ways, sort of what the internet has afforded us is this ability to do it virtually, um, which tends to be the norm now, but of course you could always do it um, by hand as well. And so each of these methods has their pros and cons. Each of these methods is valid and useful for different sorts of scenarios. And I'm not gonna go into all of that today, um, just because it's a whole other <laughs> topic and way that we could dive in. But what I want to focus on 
is surveys. And the reason that I want to focus on surveys is because they tend to be one of um, the more broadly used methodologies. They also are one of the most cost effective um, and time effective sources or methods that you could implement within a project. And they allow really large sample sizes, which can be really helpful for larger scale projects or if you're trying to assess multiple spaces at one time. Um, and as I mentioned, they often are uh, administered virtually. And uh, one of the things that's really great about a survey compared to directly talking to somebody or um, observing them is, is that they allow some level of anonymity. So you have a bigger shot basically at getting people's true insights and um, thoughts on how a space or a situation is going. And then uh, one of the, another sort of really big benefit to it is, is that they're really easy to analyze and um, the data is quite clean and quick to, to look through and to clean. But like I said, all of these methods have their own cons to them as well and, um, and can be challenging in their own ways. And so one of the biggest, in fact, I think probably the biggest is, is that not all surveys or even the questions within a survey are created equally. And there's a whole field of study called psychometrics that goes into designing and creating surveys that are both reliable and valid, meaning they give us an accurate measure and metric of what a person's behavior is like. Um, and that takes time and effort to develop those surveys and to, to really test them in a rigorous way. Um, it's also really challenging that it is an actual skill to write questions that avoid bias or leading the participant in any sort of way. Um, it can be hard, depending on the kind of survey question that you're writing, to um, to get and tap more deeply into sort of the depth of somebody's experiences. Um, but there are ways around that by like implementing different types of questions from like having some free response versus forced choice kinds of things. And then they also rely on self-report. So meaning they rely on the participant telling us how they feel, which inherently is just flawed by nature because we all have our own perceptions and biases and, um, and perceptions of ourselves that we're working through. Uh, that come out in those sorts of responses. And also people are notoriously bad at predicting future behaviors. So we rely a lot on recalling past events as well as predicting future events or like the ways that you would feel. Um, and that can be challenging for, for all of us as humans. And, um, and then the method in which you're conducting a survey can also affect your results. And there's a lot of research on each of these topics, both the pros and the cons of these methodologies, as well as others that I've mentioned. But um, so there's lots that uh, survey makers know to try to uh, combat some of those issues. And so one of the biggest ways to mitigate these kinds of challenges is to look to experts in the field um, to try to help you with those pieces, either by using their tools or um, invoking them to design custom tools for you, or even just having them help you to help you in the guidance of data collection and interpretation, um, or even helping you design your own survey too. And so, uh, as Bill mentioned, we have a post occupancy survey at UC Berkeley, um, but there are a number of surveys in the market that are great and um, many also associated with other universities as well as companies and so over here on the left side of the screen i've just named a few of the big players um, and people that we've worked with too in the past um, all of these are really well respected within the field and each of them have their own strengths and weaknesses um, they sort of roughly assess the same kinds of things and the same sorts of questions. Um, but as we'll talk about later, that's something that hopefully we'll see shift over time. Um, and 
I, you know, they all vary in cost and effort, both to you as well as to the, the research or survey team that's building it. Um, and it should be noted too, or it's helpful to note that, like I said, ours is here, but it's one that a lot of these are based within. Um, and so there's a lot of overlap between them. And so with that, Bill kind of mentioned this as well, but the CBE is in um, 1999, and it was really the first of its kind where we were starting to try to, or my group was starting to try to make uh, post-occupancy evaluations in a way that could be scalable and be done virtually. And so with that it began as a research study and still is a, an ongoing longitudinal research study that we have within our group um and as a result we've collected one of the largest databases in the world of this kind of data um and we've utilized it across many different building types from offices, healthcare spaces, laboratories, education space, both higher ed as well as K through 12, um, and even some residential spaces in the form of like dormitories and then some multi um, multifamily residential spaces. And with this data collection, it's also allowed us to start creating a benchmark or an average of how buildings perform. And We've collected this data mostly in the United States or in North America rather, um, but we have collected in many other countries throughout the world. And um, that also allows us to start kind of comparing and seeing how might culture or how might building norms across countries um, shift and, and affect perceptions, et cetera. Um, and as you might imagine too, with a tool that's you know over 20 years, it's gone through many iterations, but we've sort of kept this core set of questions that have um, been maintained as things have evolved through the years. And so because this survey has been around so long and was sort of the impetus for tools like this, um, we have felt that it was important to do some self-assessment and to really look at this tool and say, okay, if it's being used to make all kinds of building decisions and design decisions, and it's also informing our knowledge of building science and how occupants interact with space, it's also time for us to take a real look and say, is this assessing what it should be? And where might our gaps be? And where might the opportunities to expand it and evolve as the field has evolved um, come into play as well? So um, just to give you some kind of higher level background on why this tool ever gets used beyond research too is, is that it's really intended to kind of diagnose a space and understand what's working, what's not working. People use our tool as well as others like it to um, go for building certification systems. Um, and the intention really is to provide some sort of data and tangible evidence for a building owner or um, a firm to understand how their design might be affecting the occupants themselves so that you can make informed decisions on where to invest or reinvest in aspects of the design. And um, as was mentioned earlier too, it takes approximately 10 minutes. Uh, we typically say like a range of eight to 12 minutes because depending on how satisfied or how positively somebody is viewing the space, they'll see fewer questions. Whereas when we see some level of dissatisfaction, um, the person will see more questions to try to pinpoint what's going on and what might be driving that um, negative perception. And our tool historically has primarily focused on this concept of satisfaction, as well as how the environment is influencing a person's productivity. And um, as I said, what are the sources of any kind of dissatisfaction or um, lack of, of ease that occurs within the space? And so over here on the right, you can see the kind of broad categories that um, I'll talk about in a little bit as our benchmark. Um, 
but this is also sort of the typical survey flow. So we talk about the person, we talk about the, or we ask about the person rather, we ask about the physical environment and the specific features within it. Um, so like the acoustics, the lighting, the thermal comfort, um, the cleanliness of the space, uh, the furnishings, et cetera, and how that's impacting the person. Um, we'll also ask some sort of general questions that are tailored towards each specific project. And then um, we ask for an overall assessment of the building. So how are they perceiving that space in general as an amalgamation of everything? Um, and as I mentioned, it's used in multiple building types. Um, we have versions for each building type, and we also have uh, more recently a well version that is kind of nudging in the directions that I think that um, we all should be working towards in where we're really encompassing more than those satisfaction kinds of questions. But that specific version meets different uh, or both versions well. Or, well versions one and two and then we also have ex, um, these what we call add-on modules so we're always building these um so that you know users have access to them but they are add-in questions that really focus on some sort of targeted component of the space that perhaps the broader survey doesn't so like accessibility or wayfinding um and biophilia things like that So as I said, what we were really interested in was trying to start some sort of like self-assessment to see how is our tool performing? What, what does it contribute to the field? What does it help people with? Is it measuring what we want it to? And how can it be improved? Um, and so uh, what we did was we cleaned through our whole database, stripped out anything that um, was incomplete or not comparable. And so um, in January 2020, we ended up with about 897 buildings. And as you might remember from the beginning of all of this, we've got a lot more in the database, but this is just a very clean set of um, spaces with like full responses and, uh, and whatnot. And so that amounted to about 93,000 um, occupant responses. And then here you can just see a breakdown of how many surveys we have from each building type within this category or within this uh, data set. And so um, as you can see, office spaces uh, make up the majority of that data, um, followed by education spaces, laboratories, and so on. And um, what we really did for the purposes of trying to look at this assessment tool is we focused on office spaces. Each one of these building types has the same set of core questions. Um, it just, there's also sort of add in questions that uh, target specifics of that typology. But when we were looking at the broader database, we were trying to understand, okay, what are these big, what are the big trends that we see across how people perceive space? And so, for instance, we saw that people tend to be just most satisfied with their ease of interaction, amount of light, and overall cleanliness, and they tend to be least satisfied with sound privacy, temperature, and noise level. Um, and these problem points are things that we see a lot um, that other researchers and others in the field have seen uh, repeatedly within their work, uh, especially of office spaces and open spaces. And um, why understanding what's what these sort of like top performers and worst performers of an environment are useful is because it starts to show us, okay, well, if I'm performing, if my building is performing poorly in acoustics, then we can start to say, okay, well, how does that perform poorly compared to other spaces? Um, because that's useful to know that that tends to be a challenge point. So it doesn't necessarily mean that that space is awful. It just means that it's, it, it's useful to look at where it's struggling on that particular piece. Um, something that I'll note too, and that you may have made mental note as you were looking at the dates I just provided is, is that this was all pre-pandemic. 
And so um, something that I personally am really interested in seeing next is, is how these perceptions change or whether or not they stay stable um, as we sort of enter into this new normal, um, especially considering things like cleanliness and ease of interaction were things that people were happiest with. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the pandemic uh, changes that or doesn't. Um, and then also we looked at uh, these questions around productivity. So um, how people feel the environment is impacting them and uh, overall, largely people are most bothered by acoustics and feel like the acoustics of the space negatively impacts their work. Um, but least impacted by the cleanliness of the environment. So again, it will be interesting to see how things continue to evolve as our spaces evolve and new designs emerge. Um, and then here's just some highlights that overall, uh, about two thirds of the population are satisfied with their workspaces in general. 40% believe that our acoustics and thermal comfort are probably the most uh, problematic and impact productivity. And about uh, a quarter believe that the office layout contributes to lack of productivity. So all really useful things to know, especially if you're thinking about going into a new design of a space and anticipating where problem points might be, or in looking at how your space is performing and why, or giving some context into how normalized that might be. So in addition to looking at these high level metrics, um, we also did some statistics to look at the specifics of our measurement features of our tool. So meaning again, are these items doing, are these survey items or questions doing what we expect them to do? And so, um, don't worry about thinking too hard or going through uh, specifics of all of these analyses, but I've listed them here for anyone who is interested. Um, but basically what we did was we did a series of statistical analysis starting from something really broad to then zeroing in to see how statistically all of our items hang together and what the broad measurement features are that the tool is actually capturing. Um, and so here on the right, you can start to see that we had this cluster of, I don't know, I guess about 12 or, or so um, items like temperature, air quality, general maintenance, cleanliness, et cetera, that came out. So meaning that these are all features that um, appear to be being tested. And then we also saw, okay, well, how do each of those features hang together? So what this is showing then is, for instance, personal workspace, the building overall, ease of interaction, and amount of space relate to the layout and that sort of broad category of measurement, whereas visual privacy is sort of like its own um, bucket around privacy. Um, and then, of course, visual comfort, amount of light is with lighting, et cetera. So what this again showed us is it, it started to give us a clearer picture of what we were really measuring and how each individual survey item relates to one another, where they overlap and where they start to differ. Um, and so whenever you're creating a measurement tool, what you ideally want is you want some overlap so that you can um, increase your reliability or the consistency with which you're measuring something. But then you also want some divergence because especially if you're measuring multiple kinds of variables like we do in this um, tool as well as all most post-occupancy evaluations um, that you're actually capturing different things and you're not just measuring, for instance, like how the building is overall. Um, that you're measuring that nuance and variance. And so what we did next was we looked at our benchmark metrics. So 
these sort of broader categories that we use and that people or users of this tool end up using to make building decisions. And we said, okay, how do these measure up with um, the structure that our previous analysis was showing us? And so what you'll see first here on the uh, the right hand side of the screen, this sort of uh, pink or pre 2020 benchmarks is you can see these are the categories that we were um, measuring and how we were clustering those uh, broader 12 to 15 categories that we were looking at. And then based on that analysis, though, that we did, we came up with a new set of benchmarks that we feel captures um, this assessment tool a little bit more elegantly. And so um, you'll see that some components like the overall building have kind of dropped off and then we've pulled out um, visual privacy into its own category. And part of why uh, we ended up dropping building overall is, is that it was really related to um, the specific space that a person or the personal space that a person was occupying. And so we weren't really capturing variants there. We were seeing that those two things were basically measuring the same component. So what do we do with all of this and why might it matter? Why is it even useful to be looking at a tool in depth and kind of nerdily diving into all the statistics of all of that? And the point is to say is, is that as our spaces are evolving, our measurement tools should too. And um, it's important to be reevaluating and trying to understand what we're doing well, what we're measuring well, and then also um, sort of cataloging what we know and saying, okay, what else do we not know yet? Um, and so some of these questions that we've come up with as we've looked at this data too is thinking about uh, things that we don't know yet is what makes a person select the space that they're selecting. And that becomes increasingly important as things like agile workspace or flex spaces come into play. And then now as um, you know, hybrid or being able to work remotely versus coming into the office and um, having different kind of desking arrangements comes into play. Um, and then also, there's not a, a ton in these post occupancy evaluations looking at other sort of psychological factors that we know from the field of psychology matter a lot in space. So, like people's need for control or personalization. Um, sensitivity towards different environmental features and even environmental engagement and also thinking about how frequently are we measuring so typically um, as has been done we measure a space once or like when there's some sort of renovation or a big move um, but we don't often look at them um, more frequently. And some of our standards are pushing that and pushing that change rather to encourage us to measure more frequently and measure um, more rapidly, which is great because just like our spaces evolve and shift over our time, so do our occupants. And so the ways in which that place is performing for a person or for an organization is going to change too as the people within it change. So um, increasing measurement is something that uh, is important. And then as I said, kind of at the start of this is thinking about how can we really shift our spaces and our measurement from just thinking about survival in a space to actually thriving in a space. So something that you may have noticed with our tool, for instance, is that we focus a lot on dissatisfaction, but as a result of this work, we're now looking at adding in questions around what actually works, what is working. So we know where can people keep investing or know is a good investment. And then where could we also use design to enhance um, these features that work well? And then also looking at things that, again, are sort of more psychological in nature, like people's preferences or emotions and the needs that they need fulfilled within that space. Those things are really important. 
And we know that they're important to the success of a design, but oftentimes we neglect them in post-occupancy evaluation. So um, looking at that and looking at how spaces are supporting what specific activities they need to be supporting is really useful and a, a needed move. Um, and then also, especially as populations evolve, our uh, individual differences come more prominent and um, become more important. So trying to understand those individual differences of the person that you're assessing is also really useful. But because, for instance, in some of my own work, we've found that there is relationship between a person's personality and the ways that they experience acoustics in the environment or um, the motivations that they might have for different behaviors that could impact indoor air quality. And so personality is just one example, but our abilities, our age, our um, physical and mental differences, all of those things are important factors for us to be exploring more deeply so that we can design spaces that are both useful for the broader population, but also support individuals. So with that, I'll open up for questions. And here's just a few links if you're interested in um, reading more about our specific research or about our survey. Um, and then of course, to get in contact with one another, um, I'd love to connect. So thanks so much and let's go to questions. So Lindsay, we did have a question, which I went ahead and answered, but maybe I'll uh, just let you confirm this. So uh, someone said some of the rows, you know, that you showed in terms of satisfaction don't apply to design, I don't know, like cleaning service and general maintenance. And they wanted to know why you were asking those questions. And I just made the point that the survey tool is used by many players in the built environment, including building owners and managers. And thus, you know, it may not be directly relevant to an architect, but it is relevant to people involved in the whole sort of, you know, building design, construction, operation, occupation. Um, and then I did say, you know, as an architect, you could make something more difficult to keep clean through one design rather than another. So I don't think it's completely off the table. But is that, do you want to talk a little bit just about all the groups that use occupancy surveys? Yeah, um, that was a great response and thank you for providing that. And, you know, aside from the different users or people who are, who are trying to use a tool like this, um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, from an architecture design standpoint, you may not have control over each of those factors, just like, for instance, you, you won't have any control over uh, the occupants themselves or like what kinds of people are in that space. But by actually knowing those other factors might be at play and could be what's influencing their perceptions of the space in general or even specific features within the space that you do have control over gives you more power and understanding, okay, maybe it's not my design, Maybe it's this other contributing factor that's influencing the way the design is being perceived. It also allows you something to bring back to your client or other stakeholders about where they could make the improvement. So again, even though you might not have control over the cleaning services, that's really valuable insight that you can provide to them in showing, okay, well, it wasn't the design investment that you've made that is causing challenges here. It's something more programmatic or it's something more um, specific to your building that your tenant is existing within or, um, you know, another feature that they could adjust um, beyond your specific team adjusting it. You know, as a follow up to that, um, I, I've been struck by this for decades, honestly, when I when I go down BART stations in San Francisco, or I guess really anywhere where they're underground, as I go down these long steep escalators, 
I see the um, old fluorescent up lights that are, you know, shining up onto the sort of relatively light colored concrete. And they look like they have about two decades of dust on them. <laughs> and, and the light level of the station is, is oftentimes remarkably low. And mm -hmm. I have oftentimes thought up lighting, given that no one is main or is cleaning those lights, is probably not the way to light these stations, or it is the way to light the stations, but somebody's got to clean the lights. So, I mean, that seems, you know, just an example of something that sort of jumped out at me. Um, yeah. So, Lindsay, another question is, um, what areas, and you sort of pointed to some of these, uh, seem to be the most troublesome. Is it HVAC and comfort? Obviously, acoustics came up a lot. So what, are, what were the ones that came up as troublesome and have you had any interactions with architects on kind of how they responded to learning that? Yeah, so um, thermal comfort and acoustics tend to be the most problematic, at least historically. And um, so suggestions around intervention in ways that I've seen buildings respond to some of that have ranged from like for instance in the case of acoustics i've seen different um of course like acoustical paneling and other kinds of um more structural things getting put into this space um i've also seen examples of uh something that could be more organizational like offering um, in some work that we were doing, we had found um, acoustics to be quite problematic. And so one really easy intervention for an organization is providing noise canceling headphones or um, having different policy implemented on how shared space gets used. So whether or not um, you know phone calls need to be made in shared space versus in phone booths, et cetera. Um, and then there's also been some great examples that I've seen before of systems getting implemented where uh, people will have uh, like a, a signal of sort at their desk space that, you know, like imagine, for instance, like a red light, green light kind of thing where saying, okay, it's okay to interrupt me or to talk near me versus it's not. And so those are some examples of really um, kind of again, things that a designer or architect might not be involved in in that process, but it's very powerful to be able to come back with those kinds of examples of intervention that could occur um, that's very behavioral and organizational. And then with regards to thermal comfort, um, some more kind of tangible design decisions, you know, have been around like implementing ceiling fans and um, more specifically also uh, creating personal control or personal control devices within spaces that allow people to have more say over their thermal comfort. So for instance, in our group, one of the field studies that we've done in, in the inter, we've, some of my colleagues have created different kinds of personal comfort devices specific to thermal comfort, like um, hand and foot warmer type things that can be at a desk space or what we have uh, a cooling and heating chair, like office chair that will adjust to the occupant or the occupant can adjust to it or adjust it to their needs. And then um, some of you may be familiar with other systems like Comfy um, that allows for voting and ranking of how a space is feeling so that the building system could respond to adapting um, the temperature of the space depending on what the population is saying in the moment. And so that's something that's an example of other sorts of innovations that I think things like the Internet of Things are affording us more and more where we can create these more responsive building systems and design um, features to work in real time with occupants as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions. So um, one was that the COVID-19 experience, you know, kind of is suggesting 
more ventilation, operable windows, perhaps. Um, and then another question is sort of related to that is, have you had an opportunity to do any surveys, um, you know, in in offices that have that have reopened um, post pandemic? And are you, you know, I know you said you're, you're that's something you want to look at. I guess the, really the question is, do you have any data on that at all yet? On sort of what how this is changing? Yeah, that's a really great question. So. Um, Yes, with regards to ventilation changes and thinking of, you know, um, of course, there's lots of discussion around density and um, air filtration, air ventilation, how to keep our spaces air quality clean. Um, with regards to collecting data around how things have shifted in the pandemic, like, I, <laughs> I truthfully wish that we had uh, more than we do, but it, like from my end of things and seeing how surveys have been uh, started and stopped over the last year and a half or so, it's been exactly that. We do have a number of surveys that have been implemented, um, mostly actually going for well certification. And so um, that tends to have, that's an interesting sort of trend that we're seeing in our own surveys at least, is, is that there's been kind of this shift in focus. And my guess is, is that's sort of pandemic related and um, around this idea of, you know, wanting to promote health or think mindfully about health. Um, but, uh, the short answer is, is that we haven't done those analysis yet. We're finally, after this year, we've started to pick up kind of more data that's come in. And we've been, um, we've had sort of an influx, especially over this fall of new surveys, um, many of which are aiming to complete or to start in the spring. And so, I'm really personally very interested in seeing those questions too and um, seeing if and how things have shifted. We also, we're trying to work through figuring out how to implement um, other kinds of assessments to kind of bridge this gap with remote work and primary um, sort of workstations. Uh, so we're building a module that looks at that so that there could be that ability to have kind of a mixed um a mixed space workspace assessment um but these are all really important questions too that honestly like myself as well as i'm sure other survey providers in the field are trying to adapt and think about in real time right now as things just keep shifting yeah so uh we've got a couple more questions so um one person asked, um, you know, how do your surveys or how, what have you seen in your surveys around, um, you mentioned neurodiversity. And so the person is saying, what about types of diversity around gender, race, social uh, identification, I guess, you know, are you, do you collect, you know, simplest example would be to say, you know, uh, do you see a difference between gender identified male female, non-binary, you know, that's an example. Um, is the survey seeing any things there? Is that data that you, anyone is, people are asking you to collect? Have you been collecting it? You know, how far do you break it down, I guess, is part of the question. Yeah. So the, there's a couple different pieces to that. So one being that most surveys, ours included, up until um, that was a shift that I made when I when I started working on our survey was including um, beyond just male female genders. So we we collect data on that and in very like we've expanded the variance basically to be more inclusive to capture. Um, other folks that wouldn't identify in that specific way. And so with that, our data is still quite new, meaning it's not robust. Like we don't have a ton of data looking at non-binary perceptions. Um, 
I don't know of other surveys that include that or that have included that for longer than ours, rather. And so I haven't seen a ton of data there. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's just not something I've run across yet. Um, I think the neurodivergence piece and other sorts of individual differences like that are also really important and something that um, I would love to get into our survey and into other surveys. If I'm being just kind of like transparent about where we get pushback in our survey um, with clients sometimes is in asking those people pieces. Sometimes HR, uh, HR groups of different organizations get pretty riled up about asking those demographic type questions. And um, a survey like ours, we are under um, ethics review all the time within the university. And so meaning that we're constantly creating safeguards to make sure that all of our data is anonymous and couldn't be pieced together to pinpoint a specific individual um, and is you know, kept in very secure ways, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, but that's not the case for all surveys. And it's still something that can make people kind of uh, anxious. And so it's just like that question that first came up around like, well, if there's something like cleanliness, et cetera, that we don't have a lot of control over, why are we measuring it? I argue that it's important to be measuring these people pieces too, because if we don't understand the people in our spaces and how, who they are is influencing our per their perceptions, then it makes it really hard to design a sp effective space for all kinds of individuals. So I wish I had more like concrete things to say about that, but um, that's exactly the direction I think, uh, or one of the directions that I think we should all be headed. Yeah, great answer. And, and I think I, I hear you when you say, you know, you, you have to work with HR organizations and things like that. So. Uh, you know, you're running the survey for a bill in for a client. And so it kind of has to mesh with what the client wants to know as well. Um, so let me ask you another uh, a question was, um, do you, I, I know most of what you presented was for offices and one person is asking if you are familiar with the kind of metrics and or questions that are being used in multifamily residential. Um, any Anything there on P POE for multifamily res? Yeah, so we do have a survey of that, um, or a survey that targets that. It is a harder uh, space type because you've got so many things that are trying to be accomplished within it and you're essentially measuring multiple environments within it. I'll say that um, my particular passion place is home spaces and residential spaces. It's not a space typology that we get asked a lot about and so it's not one that um, we've or others that I know of have expanded heavily into, but I am very passionate about that environment. And if anyone ever wants to discuss that or collaborate in some way, I'm always excited to do that. Um, I think though that, like I said, one of the challenges there is just that you have so many different spaces within the space. And um, depending on who you're measuring within that environment, you kind of have to start to make cutoffs and thoughts too. Like, will you measure just the adults in the environment or um, any kind of children or, you know, other people who are visiting the space? Um, and, you know, in my own work, I can say that I've, I've also looked at a lot of things around emotion in those environments and how emotion or emotional ex expectation and preference really maps on to um, the things that are wished to be accomplished in that space. And I think that those are directions that that kind of space typology really benefits from too, because 
you've got this environment that has so much variation, but that people are really making kind of active decisions in every day. It's unlike a workspace where you might be changing the type of work you're doing, but you're really going there to work. Um, so I think that that kind of thing is really important to include in those measures. So it sounds like part of what you're saying, correct me if I'm off here, is that residential spaces can, are, first off, they're multifunctional and, and that then also they are more easily customized or, or personalized maybe is the better word. So, you know, yes, to some extent, you if you have identical uh, designed and constructed units, people may organize them differently and they may be, have greatly divergent sort of work life schedules. And so it's difficult to sort of um, actually survey uh, something really specific um, or, 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 the, or the data you're getting is affected by so many personalizable things that it's hard to interpret or, or sort of read through. Yes. And I think that like another piece I'll say to that is, is that where that could be really easily done though, is in a way where you're implementing that across a lot of people within some sort of like different design configuration that's somewhat comparable. So like for instance, when we've done residential surveys, they tend to be in multi-family units. So, or where you're having the same kind of configuration space, but you've got a bunch of different people occupying that same environment just in different environments if that yeah, yeah i don't think i said that very eloquently but well in some ways almost the bigger the better because exactly um, yeah yeah okay and um, so so related to that i mean i'm just another question that came in was you know what are you seeing regarding daylight and view and you know um i mean i think that would be something you would see in both I mean, work environments and in home environments where a view could really change your perception of, of a physical space where if you had a good view out of one unit and a bad view out of another, you might actually experience it differently. But, you know, sort of view and daylight, what, any, any thoughts on what you've seen there? Yeah, that's something actually that some of my colleagues in our group have been really diving into the last year or two. Um, so Juan Hiko, um, Stefano Scrivone, and Michael Kent have been doing a slew of projects that are trying to tackle this idea exactly of how my view and the context that you're seeing within that view influence the way that we perceive space and how um, how does day, day, daylighting and glare and all of those pieces, how do those fit into it too? And um, so they have some really cool innovative work that's coming out. Um, one of the things that sticks out to me was some work that Wan Hiko had done was she was looking at um, how view influenced productivity and perception of space. And so she conducted a lab study that was also incorporating, um, she was looking at these sort of cognitive metrics and how people were thinking and um, performing different cognitive tasks when they had a view versus when they didn't have a view. And she was also looking at how emotion changed based on um, having a view versus not. And um, one of the interesting findings that also stuck out within this broader context of indoor environmental quality and how view affects our perception was that she found that uh, when you had a view, your tolerance for thermal ranges increased. So you had the ability to be more satisfied in a warmer space, for instance, and not have it affect you negatively. And so that's really interesting because it starts to give us some insight in other ways that one aspect of design might mitigate a challenge of another. Um, and so 
I'm not sure like how or what would be best to like a good way to share some of that, but I could maybe tack it on to some slides or something, uh, some interesting articles related to that work. Yeah. And, and you know, Lisa Heshong has sort of been, I shouldn't yeah. say sort of been, has been looking at this for a long, long time. And we hope to actually sure. have Lisa um, present early next year sometime. So I'll just toss yeah, that. Yeah, Lisa is a great resource and would be a wonderful yeah. um, person mm -hmm. to talk on that. So Lindsay, here's a question that I think relates to the another broader issue about your survey or any, you know, any of the other surveys, but I think more specifically the CBE survey. Someone is asking, you know, is there an overlay for ambulatory care medical office spaces? So I'm just thinking you could answer that specifically, but you could also just talk a little bit about the ways that you customize the survey or have customized the survey over the years and just let people know, you know, if they are interested in the CBE survey, who, you know, who, what do they do to sort of explore potentially using it? Yeah, so healthcare space is another really great complicated environment. And um, we do have a healthcare survey that uh, we've recently updated a bit to try to streamline a bit more because, um, you know, kind of what that question at least is making me think it's alluding to as well is, is that there are variances in healthcare spaces and in what those might look like and how they're supporting or what their needs are um, within that design. And so broadly, like to answer kind of the bigger question, yes, we have a healthcare survey um, and our aim with it is to have it be something that is um, more sort of generalized across healthcare space. But with that, as well as with any other kind of survey too, we always have that this potential to customize or to create some sort of um, version of it that is specific to your specific project or when groups or when firms are really thinking deeply about post-occupancy evaluation and making that a part of their practice, um, I've encouraged that sort of custom work too, so that they could use it across a variety of their buildings that they're creating and, and assessing over time. So um, it's not a healthcare space, but for instance, we have a firm who has done a ton in K through 12 spaces, and they're really interested in certain features or certain components as a firm, they have the value of, um, increasing a mindset of sustainability and inclusion and diversity within their populations of um, occupants, as well as seeing how their sites fit into the broader community of where they're built. And so we've created a custom survey that's, that their firm just uses every time they have a project and that allows them to then have that to offer back to their client, but then also have something that they can start tracking within their broader portfolio and basically create their own benchmarks too, where they're able to look against ours, but they're also able to look against their own projects. And I think that that's kind of where the magic really starts to happen in taking a firm in a direction of really getting the full value out of post-occupancy evaluations rather than just kind of like checking off this tick mark that, you know, becomes a requirement for whatever reason. Um, yeah, so, so I know I, think, I kind of like deviated, but hopefully that was clear. Well, yeah, I mean, I think your point uh, again is that, you know, if particularly for design firms that, that work repeatedly in specific building types, that you have an opportunity to sort of see, well, you know, how is this building that we did where we did something different? What, what information are, how does the survey show a difference? So, you know, did that design change affect occupant satisfaction, comfort? You know, if we made a change to address 
acoustic issues that we had seen in previous projects. Are people reporting better satisfaction with acoustics as a result of that? So yeah, so it's, it, it is kind of, you know, we always talk about design as iterative. It is within a specific project, but it is within a practice over time. So I think that's a great point. Um, and I would think also on the medical side, you know, if you, you know, if there were a healthcare provider, uh, you know, I'm not plugging anyone over anybody else, but, you know, let's uh, just as an example, I mean, Kaiser, for example, ha has multiple medical office buildings and multiple ambulatory care facilities and multiple inpatient hospitals. And I would imagine that if, if you know, really, I don't mean to single them out, any healthcare provider with multiple facilities would, would potentially benefit greatly from learning sort of satisfaction, even things like potentially, I don't know if you, you're not gonna get this in a survey or your survey necessarily, but recovery rates, you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff. How is one facility comparing to another? Um, right. Well, and that's the, you know, you're raising another sort of point and potential that oftentimes I, I don't think we think about, but, you know, for instance, like a, a, a firm or anyone doing a post occupancy evaluation, you might be not, you might not be collecting, like, we're probably not going to collect patient information or those sort of recovery rates. However, your client does. And so what then you have the ability to also offer this extra sort of bonus to what you as a firm is providing is saying, okay, well, you've got this data, but I'm offering you this other data that could also provide more context to the information that you're also collecting. And so there's this possibility for a more integrated approach with that client and also the possibility of adding even more value to what you're giving them um, as the architect. Yeah. So, uh, Lindsay, another question um, is you've talked a lot about user perception and, and the question is, have the, you done surveys that look or 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 others done things looking really kind of at physical space characteristics and you know what happens when you or what do you see um, or do you see a relationship between a particular physical space characteristic and satisfaction so i think it's kind of saying are there sort of physical design parameters that um I mean, I guess you've touched on some things like views and daylight, but are there other things about physical design parameters that you've seen show up in surveys and are there any that have particularly surprised you or that challenge, you know, typical perception? Yeah, absolutely. Like, so some work by my colleague Stefano Scavone and um, some others, they had looked at uh, more of the sort of building characteristics that are collected about spaces um, and how that relates to these perceptions within the database. And one of the, um, there are a number of things that have come out around that and I'm blanking and won't do justice to the specifics of it right this second, but it's another one of those pieces that I can share um, more directly. But um, for instance, what is something that was interesting that comes out there too is, is that the amount of space somebody is given is also uh, predictive of whether or not they're going to like that environment. And so something else that's kind of interesting though is, is we, Stefano had looked at that within this sort of more North American centric population of our database. But then we also, um, more recently with another colleague of ours, Toby Chung had looked at uh, a subset of buildings where we were doing a lot of data collection with our survey and with kind of like a modified version of the survey where we were also collecting information on well-being and um, 
uh, sick building syndrome and those sorts of things in Singaporean buildings. And so we found that there is a difference in that particular population where um, it's a perception of clean cleanliness was more predictive of the overall satisfaction compared to like the building, the amount of space. And so um, we're also kind of seeing those differences, which is interesting as you're able to kind of expand across cultures. But absolutely, there's some good work looking at the specific building features too. And, you know, with that, I'll say also, that's another one of those things kind of like the challenge of productivity or measuring well-being and, and these sort of more abstract concepts or harder to make concrete concepts. Um, when you're looking at building features, you're also having to really catalog and quantify how one is the same across another. So something, for instance, that Steph knows work has looked at is like a year or how old a space is. Um, and we've also looked at things like what kind of HVAC systems um, a building has and, um, and how that is affecting perception. Um, and affecting these issues around acoustics, et cetera. Um, and then something that we're trying to come up with a stronger way to quantify and kind of got a little thrown off with COVID, honestly, is um, around biophilia. So we have this biophilia module that looks at these sort of perceptions of biophilia. But we also know that it's important to know the physical features that might connect in with that. And so when somebody does our biophilia module, we also ask that they collect or that the design team um, completes information about the physical features of the space so that we can start doing exactly as you're saying, pairing those physical components with the perceptual components, because that's yeah. super important too. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, and I think you're also making raising the point that um, you really do need to sort of know the specifics and because, um, you know, I, I, there have been studies showing, you know, gains from, I mean, 20 years ago, HMG, Lisa Heshong's uh, uh, firm, you know, did a study that showed increased uh, student test scores and sales in skylighted buildings. Um, but I think also Lisa showed that, you know, um, daylight with glare, you know, has a negative effect. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not just, I think you can't just say, oh, daylight, you know, it's got to be sort of controlled daylight or it's, it's diffuse daylight through skylights, not direct sun, things like that. Um, okay, so, um, Lindsay, we're almost out of time. So I wanted to ask you one last question. I'll ask you, um, and you may or may not have anything to add on this is, you mentioned that there are other academic institutions and, you know, um, that are doing this, you know, is there anything you want to, you would add about that? Are there, are there, you know, particular institutions that are working in one area or opposed to another? You know, is there anything that you would, that you want to add if you want to, and you can just say, no, there, you don't have anything to add if you don't. But is there anything you would say about, you know, other sources of POE that are out there that you know of? I guess just that, you know, those folks that I list on that slide are all doing great work in this area. And um, there's also some great work done at, um, at Sydney, University that is looking at um, indoor environmental quality and they sort of expanded into Melbourne and that's one of those surveys that you'll see on there because uh, one of their main POE persons uh, moved there, but they all are great uh, resources and programs and everyone kind of focuses in a little bit different direction like um, I uh, for instance, our group is really heavily into thermal comfort and energy efficiency in addition to this POE piece. And so that's really gone into informing how 
the CBE survey was originally created and adapted. And you can kind of see remnants of that in different places. And so every group's um, leaders and people who are there with their different expertise all kind of, I think, inadvertently shape what those occupancy sure. evaluations look like. Sure. Um, for instance, the Colorado folks that are listed on there, a lot of them uh, are do sort of more um, like observational or, or anthropological. I don't know if they would describe it that way specifically, but that's kind of how I conceptualize it. And so um, their POEs tend to focus kind of on that storytelling side too. And so, um, you know, in addition to these kind of bigger surveys that everyone offers, there's also, um, honestly, well has been a big push towards some of those other universities kind of like pushing their survey further, um, which I think is great. And within the within IWBI, there's been a focus in trying to get surveys to kind of unify on these metrics to an extent so that in addition to everybody collecting and creating these databases, we can also start to kind of get at those bigger questions. Um, like I was mentioning of how do we operationalize or how do we define these metrics that we're all interested in and how can we start to create like a mega database basically yeah. to compare across? Yeah, great, great. So, you know, I mean, I know that CBE quite a while ago, you know, did a, uh, you know, was looking at user satisfaction in lead certified buildings. I mean, um, and it it's, I think it would be fascinating to have, if not you, maybe another member of the team to come back and just talk about links or correlations you're seeing between energy efficiency and, you know, satisfaction and, you know, what aspects of energy efficient buildings, you know, energy efficiency in and of itself can be achieved, you know, multiple ways, but, you know, is a tight, well-ventilated building, you know, producing satisfaction. So maybe that's something we can explore. So, okay. Yeah, so, so thank you very much, Lindsay, um, for your presentation today. Really appreciate it. Um, and then just a couple of things for everybody online. So if you've made it this far, um, AI California will submit for your AIA continuing ed credit, and it should appear in your transcript in a, in a couple of weeks. And um, Lindsay's presentation and a recording of the presentation will be available you know, like I said, probably by Friday or maybe Monday. Um, Lindsay, I put in the chat window a link to the CBE website and specifically to the survey, but I think that's in your PDF. So if people didn't pull it out of the chat, it'll, you can get it once the P PDF is available. Um, last few things are, you know, aiacalifornia.org slash climate action for more resources and tools on, on a whole host of issues. And then um, we're doing an upcoming webinar on the building decarbonization practice guide. And uh, we'll be sending out something on how to register for that um, shortly in a follow-up email. So Lindsay, thank you again for your presentation. And thank you to everybody for um, calling in today and, and listening. So yeah, great thanks job. so much. And thanks for all the great questions too. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone.